Okay, hi everyone. I think we're ready to get started. So come on in and welcome also to everybody who's uh, joining us online. We are going to do our best to try to get everybody's questions answered, including the online questions. Um, so hi, I'm Lisa Marie Nampia. I'm a CNCF ambassador, and I would like to uh, welcome you to the GetOps Working Group session. Please do not be shy. There will be someone running around the room with a microphone to make sure we get all of you heard. Please wait until the microphone comes to you before you start asking your question. Otherwise, somebody up here is going to have to repeat the question. Um, anyway, welcome, and I'll first introduce my dear friend, Dan Garfield, um, and you can kick it off from here. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Um, awesome. So, yeah, we're the, we're the GitOps Working Group, which is a uh, working group established underneath the CNCF last year in a partnership between uh, GitHub, Azure, AWS, Red Hat, Weaveworks, and CodeFresh. Um, and the goal of the GitOps Working Group was essentially to come together and work out a standard for how GitOps should work, what the principles should be. Um, so I'm Dan Garfield. I'm the Chief Open Source Officer and a co-founder of CodeFresh. Cornelia? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Cornelia Davis. Um, I have spent the last 10 years or so working on developer platforms, worked on Cloud Foundry, worked on some Kubernetes platforms with Pivotal and VMware as well. And then I was at, v at, at Weaveworks when we created the, uh, the GitOps working group, and we'll talk about the Open GitOps project as well um, to clarify that, and uh, just recently moved over to Amazon. All right, and uh, well, thanks everybody for, for joining. Happy, happy to see people again. Uh, my name is Leonardo Murillo, everybody calls me Leo. I'm Principal Partner Solutions Architect at Weaveworks and co-chair uh, to the GitOps working group. Hey folks, uh, Chris Sanders. I'm a program manager in Microsoft Azure, and in particular, I work on um, the Azure GitOps service, uh, which you're very happy to talk about today. Yes, and uh, my name is Christian Hernandez. I'm a senior, senior principal technical marketing manager. I think I have the longest title um, <laughs> out of all of us here um, over at Red Hat. And um, um, my focus at Red Hat is actually GitOps practices and our OpenShift uh, GitOps uh, product. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. So the format of this is pretty open. We basically wanted to have a discussion talking about the new principles. We just released Open GitOps 1.0. Um, and we also want to invite people to ask questions. And we'll have a, kind of an open field, open format. We were all able to commit to that because it required minimal preparation. Uh, <laughs> so you know, we'll, we'll have to see how it goes. And maybe, Cornelia, uh, since you mentioned it, you could kick off the difference between Open GitOps and the GitOps Working Group. Yeah, um, sounds great. And I think this is a source of confusion at times, um, in particular because of the way that we named things when we first got started. Um, so for those of you who might have been in the, uh, um, the keynotes this morning where we talked about the various projects, so Constance and uh, Jasmine gave updates on the projects. So those were projects that had reached incubation and reached graduation were the, some of the projects that they talked about. And then I talked about the technical advisory groups that support kind of that, that overall agenda. And um, when we started the GitOps Working Group, we put it forth as a project. And we, were, we made Sandbox. So it was a Sandbox project. But it was a bit confusing for everyone because they were like, wait, a working group is a project? Working group, aren't working groups made up of people? And what happens with that? And so one of the first things that we sorted out um, as the GitOps working group was we said, no, 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 no. The project is actually called Open GitOps. And we, we went through a, a very open source project kind of way of selecting that name. And so you can think of the Open GitOps project as the project that houses all of the artifacts that we're creating. And we'll talk about some of those artifacts. Dan just alluded to the fact that there's these principles. But there's other artifacts that we'll be creating. So that's the home of all of the artifacts, just like other projects might have code artifacts and documentation artifacts. It's the same thing here. And we may generate some sample code and those types of things as well. So think of the Open GitOps as the project. It's a sandbox project. That means it's a CNCF project. And it has, um, it has the, uh, the you know, a governance pr practice around it, and it's the GitOps working group that cares and feeds that project. Yeah, perfect. I mean, that, I think, I hope that clears up any confusion about it, and like uh, Cornelia mentioned, we just released 
Open GitOps 1.0 as a set of principles. Um, and as a set of standards, this isn't something that, you know, the, the group here on the stage, we all just said, let's get together and we're going to pass down from on high the correct principles and we'll expect the community to embrace it. Actually, it was a, a very collaborative process. We had, I think, uh, over 80 or 90 different participants. We had 60 plus different companies represented in that process. Um, Leo, you've been super deep into that process. Maybe you can share a little bit about um, how we came up with these principles, how these standards came out, how we refined them. Right, I, so I, I think, and this is also relevant to all the people that, that's joining us today, both here as well as virtually, right? Uh, the, the process has been fully driven through community collaboration, right? Uh, what, what we're looking to define is how these principles, how GitOps is implemented how it's, it's actionable and real, right, uh, to the community and ecosystem. So in order for us to do that, uh, we, we really needed to hear from the community. So we, we started by creating committees, okay? So anybody can join the working group. Uh, we have monthly meetings where anybody can participate. And we started to create committees where people could meet up and collaborate and share their ideas as to what really GitOps meant for them and for their organizations. And it was a, I think it was a very enriching process, right? I think it was phenomenal. Uh, the level of depth of, of the conversations and the commitment of everybody that participated, kind of looking to, to really extract the truth out of all these uh, concepts that, that we have been looking to develop. So we meet every month. Uh, there is, of course, as Cornelia mentioned, it is an open source project. There are repositories where there's discussions that are ongoing. And we just released version 1.0, right? This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's all sorts of debate and discussion that still needs to happen as to how all these things are implemented. What's, how, how is it actionable in the, in the actual ecosystem? So I really encourage everybody to, to participate, right, in these debates, uh, keep track of what we're doing in, in our repository in GitHub. Um, and, uh, and, and be active because after all, all these artifacts that we're producing are really the reflection of what the, the industry and what the ecosystem are looking to accomplish right through, through these principles um, and through everything else that we're, that we're going to have to be putting together. Um, so yes, it's, it's, it was fascinating. Dan was also very much <laughs> yeah. involved in that. Yeah, part. you said uh, it was really, you, you put, it sounded so positive when you said it. And uh, I was thinking about all of the painful discussions and debates. <laughs> and I was like, is this going to become a flame war where, you know, and it's like things like, what does synchronize mean? What does apply it's, mean? Uh, what is, you know, like, you know, if you're going to put these things down, it's going to be in black and white. Um, it's going to be hardcore. If you, if you haven't seen the principles, up on the screen it says uh, open gitops.dev, that's the site. So I would encourage you to pull it up and, and check out the four principles that are there um, and, and look through them because uh, they might sound simple by themselves, but it actually represents a lot of experience and thought. And people, people have been doing some of these things for 15, 20 years. I think, Cornelia, you and I talked a little bit about how this is not, there, there are things that are new about this, but it, there's also a lot of old stuff in this too. Yeah, I mean, no question. Although there, the one thing that I want to be careful is that you're, you're right, people have been doing this, People have also been doing things that we that don't follow the GitOps principles. And because they're using Git, they believe they're doing GitOps. Um, and there are a couple of principles that are really crucial um, that, if you will, Kubernetes has afforded us. And it's the notion that there's automation that's convergent. And so if you take a look at the principles, the principles talk about automation, but they also talk about declarative state. And so that isn't to say that having automation that is triggered off, having a script that is triggered off of a git commit or a, a, a git merge um, is a bad thing. It just doesn't take you all the way to a new way of managing your systems. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is one of the things that, that's one of the things that's not as well understood about the whole GitOps movement is that it does, the principles do represent something very foundational that hasn't been ubiquitous. It's been used in some places. There have been convergent systems before, but Kubernetes popularized that. Oh, yeah. And Chris or Christian, feel free to jump in. I don't, yeah. this isn't a... 
you yeah, know, yeah, it, it, it isn't. Them. Well, it, it's it's funny that um, that uh, Leo put it um, so so eloquently, but like it almost did feel like a lot of blood, so went, tears went into this because it <laughs> there was a lot of uh, you know they they do seem simple, but there was a lot of passion. Um, um, you know, in, in defining these principles and, and, and making it open and, and vendor neutral, I think it was it was powerful that um, it was brought forth in that aspect, right? Like it, it wasn't, you know, there there's um, there was members from from WeaveWorks, there was uh, um, you know from from CodeFresh, from Red Hat, right? So it, this wasn't like a a Vim versus Emacs sort of thing. Like there was like a completely opposite of like we actually came together and tried to. Um, uh, make uh, make those principles, and it's now really something that I can refer to. As Cornelia was saying, you know, a lot of people are saying, "Well, you know, I'm I'm already doing some of this infrastructure as code thing." It's like, well, that's just one piece of actually doing GitOps, and um, and now it's it's great to be able to refer to something. It's like, no, no, if you really want to do GitOps, what you're doing goes against you know one and two or you're, you know, you're doing one, two, and four, but not three, right? Like you, you know, you can have a place of reference and, and, a, and a why behind, a why behind it, right? And it's like, this is why we, you know, why you're not doing gaps or why you are doing get ups. You know, you know what comes to mind? Because I, I think w one of the things that I learned through this process is that simple is really, really hard. Yes. You know? Cause <laughs> Absolutely. Basically where we started, like complex is where we started, right? We had this complex ideas, and I think the, a lot of the purpose of the working group was to distill those ideas into concepts that were relatable, that were comprehensive, but that in their simplicity could communicate this complex context, right, that differentiates GitOps from existing patterns. And to, to me, uh, this has actually been kind of like the first time that I participated in a working group, and it was, it was fascinating to to see the dynamics of that interaction, right? Because w particularly coming from, from kind of like more structured uh, decision-making processes, right? Like within organizations, there's usually a hierarchy that defines a lot of the decisions that need to be made. But with the working group, it was such a process of Reconciliation, right? Of, of ideas. Yeah, right? reconciliation. <laughs> you know? It's another joke. Pun start, intended. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It was just, uh, kind of funny. I, I think I mentioned this the other day, but uh, one of my colleagues, Costas Capilonis, did this great um, webinar on GitOps, and he asked people at the beginning, "How many of you are doing GitOps today?" And in the audience, it was like 60, 70 percent of people were like, "Yeah, we're doing GitOps today." Then he gave a talk on GitOps. And he said, how many of you are doing GitOps today? And 5% of the audience was like, we're doing GitOps today. So there's definitely a delta. And I think we should actually talk maybe a little bit about like this delta of like what the perception is. And I think sometimes people think it just is, well, I make a commit and things happen. That's GitOps. And um, it's actually like, well, how, the, how that commit makes it from point A to point B is actually super important. And how that commit is recorded and all of these things are, are super instrumental. So maybe we can talk a little about some of like the most critical principles and differences that we view in it. So, uh, Go ahead. I'm, the, I'm the last one here. So I, I would recommend everybody take a look at the principles because I think they really have been boiled down to simplicity, which I really love. And so basically we're starting to put guardrails on the whole GitOps discussion. And it starts with these four principles. But then, um, you know, the, what I see as interesting about the Open GitOps project is then the community comes in and starts giving examples of how to apply these principles. And there's going to be many, many different scenarios out there. You talk to customers and they're, we're all over the place and how to do it. They're looking for how do I do this? What's the best way to do it? And that's where I see the Open GitOps project coming in as a way to put this information in there so that folks know how to do it. They know how to create tools that work together and all of that. Um, but as far as the principles go that are very interesting as far as a tool set for Kubernetes management, you know, the fact that, you, of course, declarative is, is huge. You know, you're not putting your business logic into code anymore. The business logic is in, is in YAML files that anyone can look at. They're starting a Git repo that's versioned so you can see what changed from one version to the next. And then your commit to your repo becomes basically that's your operation as an application developer, as a Kubernetes uh, manager. 
And you don't worry about the actual CI into the, or the CD into the, into the cluster itself, right? You worry about your CI part. And I think that's huge because it takes a big part of the loop out of places where actually you and I can cause problems if we go in there and try to do the CP, CD part ourselves. So I see the whole principles of how GitOps works as a very clean way to manage Kubernetes. And that's one of the reasons why um, Azure was very interested in making, you know, being part of this and, and seeing it go forward with the community and using the community tools. Yeah, I think, I think actually my, my favorite, um, I guess, piece of, of, of the principles is the whole discussion we've had. And you, you guys can see the discussion on GitHub, right? We've, everything, I think mostly was done asynchronously on GitHub, mm -hmm. is the, it's essentially the, con the, the concept of the control loop. And I think that's like the defining thing about, about GitOps versus um, um, doing something like with webhooks or doing something with like CI is um, that reconciliation loop, that, that control loop um, versus triggering something to happen. Um, there is the, um, uh, the, the GitOps controller, right, Wh whatever you're using, Flux or, or Argo, is uh, constantly checking. And that's that, that, that loop. That's the, I think that's, that's, that's one of the, um, one of my favorite principles because it, it kind of drives home the fact that um, we're leveraging the, the platform of Kubernetes. We're leveraging that 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 uh, that um, that control loop right from from each each one of those domains, and I think that is um, one of the defining factors of using GitOps versus um, what we what we um, sometimes call CI ops, right? Um, so it's uh, I think that's like a big differentiator. One of my favorite ones that is like no no something's always checking. It, it's not, it, it, they're not webhooks or anything like that. Something's always checking. So that's, that's my um, uh, favorite uh, principle there. Yeah, this is, this is a feature of control theory. And by, by the way, uh, we're monitoring questions on the platform, and we're gonna, I think we're going to come to those in a moment. And if people have things from the audience, you want to raise your hand, and uh, Lisa will run around. And it looks like we have one over here, but wh while you're running over, um, the, the control loop aspect, we, we talked about some analogies, and the classic analogy is a thermostat versus a radiator. And in an open loop, you have a radiator. It's just on, and it provides heat. And a thermostat, you set, this is the temperature I want, and there's adjustments, and there's feedback, and it's checking to see what the temperature actually is as it turns the heater on and applies it. And GitOps is meant to operate in sort of the same way, where we say, this is a state that we want, um, but there's also a... Uh, a, a checking mechanism within the operator, within the agent, that's actually saying, was this actually applied? Wait, did somebody come in and start changing things? And we need to say, no, that's not, that's not what my desired state is. I'm going to adjust for that. Uh, let's go to this question over here. Hey, thank you. Uh, I, I have a, I, I don't know, a combination of practical and philosophical question, right? So, uh, uh, I mean, our org is adopting GitOps, previous org as well, very happy that solves the obvious problems and so on and so forth, right? Uh, up to a certain level, right? Uh, as our company grows in size, and this may be applicable to subset of companies, sophistication of our tooling grows, right? Eventually, we're going to have like an internal developer platform with UIs, APIs, CLIs, and so many different interfaces and things like that. Uh, now, we can use Git as a backend for that, right? There's obviously patterns, right? You check out, you command, you create pull requests, right? I mean, but at that point, are we just not like making Git the database and like reinventing a database in Git? And is there not like a contradiction at that point, right? Like, I mean, certainly we can all like hack it and write code and that does that. But like at that point, we just created the database essentially, right? <laughs> so I, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. That's a lot to unpack. I, I would love to chime in because um, I, I think you said something really important there because Git plays, if you will, I like to think of it as a dual role in the whole GitOps agenda. One is that it can be used as the user interface, as the collaboration mechanism where everybody can come together. You can have many different eyes, sets of eyes that go on a, a commit. You can va validate that that's the right commit before you commit it. And once you commit it, then you have this convergent automation that happens. That's one element. The other element is exactly as you said. It is, if, if we think of it as the data store. Now you're right. I, at one level, it's like, wait a minute, why would we use Git as a database? Aren't there other database technologies? But Git has some semantics baked into that database that are really crucial to the GitOps agenda. 
some of those things are it's distributed. So part of the benefits of the GitOps agenda is that we, you'll, if you take a look at the pr principles, we, we do things like pull. We pull from Git rather than push out to endpoints. Well, it turns out that what you can do is you, because Git is inherently distributed, all you need to do is do a Git clone to some edge location, and now you've got, and you can have a convergent loop that's constantly updating that, so that if you have a network outage, no problem. When the network comes back, you've got a clone. So it's a distributed database, if you will. It also has important features around immutability and versioning baked in. That ability, because one of the benefits of GitOps is that you can always get back to a state. So it's, it, 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 it supports disaster recovery and a number of different cases, use cases like that. And so having versioning baked in, where I can't as an operator go and change a single line in my, a single space in my configuration and have it appear as the same version, Versioning baked in is another semantic that is so critically important. And so I'm not going to sit here and, and suggest that we might not come up with a different data store that supports the GitOps agenda, but that's part of the reason we call it GitOps is not only for the user interface, but because of the Git semantics that are baked into Git that support the goals of GitOps. Yeah, we, we were actually very careful in the principles. It does not say you have to use Git. In fact, the principles don't. It's, I know it's called GitOps, right? But but the principles actually don't mention names are Git. hard. Names are yeah, hard. Yeah, names are hard. Yeah. Um, the principles don't actually mention Git. Uh, they mention that you need to be using a versioned and immutable storage for your desired state. Now, you could be doing that with Perforce. Uh, you could be. We, we actually debated if you could potentially implement it and be con conformant with Google Sheets. And you could potentially do that. And also, you could be using Git and not be conformant. Uh, so for example, like in, in Kubernetes, everybody knows don't use the latest tag, right? Well, if you were, you're actually not using version to mutable storage because this is an end run around versioning because now you can no longer say, this is my desired state because in fact, the artifact that you're using isn't versioned. So. Uh, I mean, to your, to your fear of, like, am I implementing a database? Well, technically, if you can get a database to be versioned and immutable, you could use it as your data store for, for GitOps, uh, and that would be OK. And distributed. And, yeah, <laughs> good point. And I think that type of feedback is exactly what's going to keep this paradigm evolving, right? Yeah. Because we were really focused on not talking about implementation specifics, right? Rather, objectives that should be satisfied by a certain architecture tooling, right? So as, as the paradigm evolves and it's adopted by larger scale and different type of use cases, I think we, we will start seeing new technologies that are gonna be used for, for, for uh, storing state. Uh, what we're trying to define is what are these fundamental principles characteristics, like Neil was pointing out, right, that should be satisfied. And yes, Git is the one that satisfies them at this point in time. But as, as it evolves, there likely will be other uh, repositories that will satisfy those, those requirements. Okay, we have a couple of questions from the room, and also the questions are piling up online, and some of them are getting quite a few votes. So I want to make sure we get to a bunch of them. Um, so why don't you ask your question first, and then we'll take it off. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned the principles you work, uh, that you derive and that you started from complexity and kind of narrowed it down to more straightforward ones. I'm curious if you found some common anti-patterns that you found in multiple places and that once they set the route, it made it hard to move to, uh, to the system that works, adheres to your principle. Yeah, what, what anti-patterns do we see that keep people from implementing these principles? There's, there's a common confusion that I think you've mentioned, Dan, and that's the direction of the reconciliation process, where a lot of people think about GitOps going into the repository and not the other way around, right? Mm -hmm. when, when you think about the runtime state actually being the source of truth and then just reflected in the repository. I think that's a common misconception uh, that at least when I talk to end users, usually comes around. 
Um, and I, I also think there's this concept of, of that was actually mentioned in one of the kind of discussions in Git of this idea of weak GitOps versus strong GitOps, mm -hmm. right? Um, where, and I think, for example, WeaveWorks, we've actually identified that as a probably component of kind of like the maturity model uh, when, when you're kind of like starting up, you are really not doing continuous reconciliation. Um, so that's kind of like a couple of ideas that come to mind. I'd love to hear what, what you all have found out there. Well, I've, I've thought about this a lot too because GitOps at one point says single source of truth, right? And I think there's going to be a spread that you're going to have to decide on yourself, right? You can, the perfect would be the single source of truth. Everything goes through Git and you know exactly what's going on. But I can just give an example from, from Azure that as a managed service there, we're also offering the ability to bring in services from Azure that are delivered through Azure and agents on the, on the clusters, right? Suddenly there's multiple sources of truth. I don't know what to say to that except to say, well, there is a benefit perhaps to have multiple sources of truth instead of just a single one, but you can, have, you can decide. So that, I think that's an example of this sort of, of uh, conflict that, that can happen. Yeah, to Leo's, um, you know, just expanding a little bit what Leo was saying is that a, a, um, a lot of people do think that it's like, oh no, like I, I, I have a backup in Git, right, and thinking they're doing it. Like, no, it has, it's not, it's not a, a backup um, per se in that aspect, right? It, it can function as a backup. It's like, no, it's not a reflection. It's actually what's in, what's in your actual state. And that's kind of one of the, um, um, you know, one of the things we saw. And, um, and, and maybe not necessarily an anti-pattern. Um, there's, there's some things I think that are still left up in the air that, that came up that we kind of just uh, maybe just brushed aside a little bit <laughs> for this first go around because it's like, wow, this is a really complex problem, right? Like one of the problems is like secret management. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is the, um, I, I think there's the concept of, you know, encrypting your secret and then storing that in Git because you don't never want to, you know, store that in, 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 in coded. Um, but then is that an actual, is, is that the actual state? Like technically, like philosophically, is that the actual state? Um, and then there's some people that don't want to do that and they use something like a management system like Vault is probably like the most uh, popular one. It's like, well, then that's not, you're not even storing even the encrypted version, you're storing a reference. So then what's the source of truth there? So there's a lot of things that um, I think are still left up to discussion and, uh, uh, and not necessarily anti-patterns, but some of the things that you have to take in consideration. And I guess that goes all over for the, uh, the, disc um, the conversation that's on, on GitHub between like weak GitOps and, yeah. and strong GitOps is that um, there's, there's some, of these, um, some of these things that may or may not fit into the paradigm, they're still up for discussion. Yeah, I, I would say the two, one or two uh, biggest anti-patterns I see are people um, who are like, oh, I'm totally on board for GitOps, and then I'll apply the changes. And you're like, whoa, that's just, what? Uh, you're not, you can't be the software agent. Uh, you can't be the reconciler that's checking the, the actual state. So that doesn't work. And often I've had people, and even today I had several people ask me, they said, well, what if, what if I want to put something in Git and I, I don't want it deployed? And I was like, well, no, you said that you wanted it deployed when you put it in Git. That was the statement of intention. So if you don't want it deployed, you probably shouldn't have stuck it in your main branch or you know, the branch that's, that you've declared as your desired state. You need to have the checks on the pull request or before that uh, so that you're not applying something as your desired state. And desired state is, is also a little bit of a meta concept too because you can do something like say, my desired state is to deploy this blue container and to check to see if it meets these metrics. And if it doesn't meet these metrics, I want the yellow container that was there before to be deployed. And that's sort of, if you think about it, that is a desired state. If you're doing that as a declaration, it is your declared state. But even though there is sort of this meta element to it of, of essentially decision where you're checking a metric and, and checking back. Um, yeah, do you have I, another one? Uh, yeah, there's a, um, Beth question has a whole bunch of votes on it now. So I want to make sure we get to it. A couple of years ago, there were efforts to merge Flux and Argo CD, but they were shelved. Does the working group have any plans to revisit that, and why or why not? Uh, so within the working group, 
Red Hat and Codefresh, uh, I think, represent Argo as maintainers, and uh, Leo with, from Weaveworks is representing Flux. Um, there actually hasn't been discussions within the working group of should there be a single tool. I think as a standard, we said a standard should be tool agnostic, and it should be something that Flux is compliant with, and Argo Seed is compliant with, and potentially infrastructure can be compliant with, or other tools can be compliant with. Yeah, I think, I think as a working group and as, as an open source community, there's, there's a lot of value in diversity, right? And, and there's a lot of value in, in different approaches to solving similar problems. So we have not discussed, uh, I mean, and, and really it's not our position, right? We have nothing directly to do with other than, than kind of representing uh, our different tools uh, to make that type of, of decision within the working group. But I think what we have uh, discussed is by defining these principles and eventually working on, on programs that we can use to determine the level of conformance of different applications, matter of fact is support the ecosystem so that it's not just going to be two tools out there. There's going to be numerous evolving over time and uh, what we, what we want to accomplish is provide a solid foundation that will support those future development teams in understanding how to, how to apply these principles. Would you, would you all agree? Yeah, I think it's all about um, doing, um, uh, if something's conformant or not, and I think my mic just died, but, uh, yeah. And, um, thank you. And um, I think it's, um, it's more to do with, you know, having something uh, be compliant, right? Like, oh yeah, Argo is compliant, Flux, is, is compliant or the next great tool is compliant because they, they conform to the, to the tools and we're, we're less, um, the reason I, I like the working group is we're, we're more about the process and more about like the ideals versus you know the hammer right like we were more about you know building something versus focusing on the tool so. Yeah, and you know what these are open source so uh, if you want to write a connector for the Argo CD UI to a Flux agent. You know, the, the, I don't think the projects have that on their roadmap and there's not really an intention that I've heard of to do that within either project, but hey, it's open source, so you can go and do that and you could throw it up and uh, Argo CD also has like an extensions library, so you could add in a UI element for Flagger. Um, and there are people that use Flagger with Argo CD. So it's certainly, uh, I would say, like not something that I've, I think the projects are taking up, and it's not necessarily something that um, the GitOps working group is really take, putting an intention around. But as a community, it's not our code, so you know you can do what you want. Yeah. But those are both CNCF projects, of course. Mm -hmm. They're both incubating projects. So, mm -hmm. and remember, we we're not kingmakers in the nope. CNCF. <laughs> um, Let's see, and then, yeah, Lisa, you want to take it? Yeah, shoot. Yep, one more question. Shoot. So I work with a lot of mid-sized, large-sized enterprises, and we can implement GitOps, and it works great from a technology perspective, but then there's always the, like, the old-school ITIL. You know, they want to do releases, they want to know what's happening, when it's happening, all those things. Do you have any recommendations on how to bridge the gap between this, you know, very fast-paced, uh, you know, excellent technology, and then the business side of, hey, they want to know what's going on? Mm, who wants to make money is what I heard. <laughs> no, but, but you know, like, I, I think if, if you think about ITIL, right, and you think about change management, for example, I think Git is a phenomenal interface to, that has change management mechanisms built in, right? You have full traceability, you have auditability, you have pull requests that effectively are the interface for you to request a change. And I think this very same conversation or similar conversation happened as organizations were adopting DevOps, right? Can DevOps and the organization of kind of fast feedback cycles and constant, continuous improvement live in a world of very kind of predetermined processes as ITIL does, right? And, and I think the, it, it's, 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 it's been done. Right, it's a matter of understanding how these different patterns apply to satisfy those requirements, and and I think it's it's a matter of of education and kind of thinking a little bit outside of the usual realm of of technology. Right, you can use Git as your interface, and 
And you, you can satisfy all those different checklists uh, with, yeah. with patterns such as GitOps. I'd love to just add one thing, and it's a really kind of uh, pragmatic, I think, tip that I would give you. And it's not specific to GitOps, but when it comes to any of these major transformations that happen within an enterprise, one technique that I've seen that works really well is you've established that GitOps practice. Invite your compliance and your security folks in. Say, we are going to do a deploy today. Clear your calendar. We are going to step, we're going to show you exactly what's going on. And the cool thing is, I've seen it happen in the past where you take an entire day to do the equivalent of a git commit, right? And you step them through and you show them everything that's going to happen. And then the next day you say, we're going to do another deploy. And you have explained the whole thing. And you do the git commit and you show them that nobody can go in and muck with the version history. And so it's that it's this brilliant like moment of, oh my gosh, we just spent a whole day doing something. And you just showed me how all of these gates are all of these things are are imp implemented into the system, and now we just did the same exercise we did yesterday in eight hours. We're doing it in two minutes, and you've shown me how my requirements are satisfied. That's a very it, just invite them to the party. Don't fight them. Invite them to the party. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that. Oh, I forgot my. Can I borrow your mic? Can we get a, a mic? Uh, yeah, battery so, change for a Christian. So um, I. Uh, one of the things I always say is that automation doesn't have to be scary, right? So a lot, a lot of people think that um, like automation equals insecure, and that's like not at all, not at all true. And um, you know, the, the the process is more important than how fast it happens, right? So if if it's if it's secure, if it's um, um, here, thanks, um, and if it's uh, if if they know what the process is, and like what kind of just feeding off what Cornelia was saying is um, invite them to know, to see that process and see that it's really not scary, right? So automation doesn't have to be scary. Yeah, and I, this kind of reminds me of, uh, we had um, some people asking yesterday, and I don't want to belittle this question, but someone was saying, well, how, do you, how can you adopt GitOps if you know that Git could potentially go down? And if your Git availability isn't 100%, but you needed to make a change when Git wasn't available, what would you do? And, I thought, well, that's a good, you know, that's like a disaster recovery scenario that you should probably plan for. Um, but it was brought up as an impediment to adopting GitOps. And I thought, okay, so let's, let's play it the other way. You're not doing GitOps, and your process is what? Someone logging onto the server and applying it? Or, uh, and then if, if it's inbounds to say, what if Git is down, then it's inbounds to say, what if that person is out sick? What if this person is on vacation? Like, you're establishing this process, and to Cornelia's point, when you actually see it in action, and people are like, "Oh, is there really any visibility into this?" And it's like, "Uh, it's like there's like nothing but visibility into this. Like, like it's really clear. Like the chain of custody is clear. And chain of custody, oh my gosh, is that ever important when it comes to delivering software? And how many times there are so many places, especially in the past." where that chain of custody has not been clear, and it leads companies into situations where they're shipping vulnerabilities, where there's code that they don't know what's running on production, they have no idea, and it, it's a very, very scary place to be. So getting that chain of custody with Git, with GitOps, uh, is super powerful. And you know, just kind of like a side note that Cornelia was referring to, right? Git cannot be down. Get this distributed, and there's a bunch of copies. GitHub may be down, GitLab may be down. So that's kind of like also very important to understand as to why GitOps is so relevant and valuable, right? Because the, the source of truth can live beyond the provider that is given access to it, right? So I think that's that's important. Yeah. I think we had one more question here. The online is, um, I think they've gone to the next question because we're running a little bit over. But if you have, a, oh, are we over time? Yeah. Just a little bit. Oh, I didn't realize. No, no, no. I'm sorry, online. The next one isn't in this room until 4:30, so you're good. But okay. did you still want to ask your question? If you need to go to another session, we won't be offended. Yeah. But if you leave in two minutes, I will be. <laughs> I'm saying now's your chance. Uh, now that you have a, like version one, um, what's your roadmap? What what are you working on for version 1.1, 1. 1, mm. version two? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things uh, kind of in the works. Uh, there are some additional updates to the principles of the glossary that are in discussion. 
But one of the things we want to start working on are best practices, mm -hmm. which uh, we've envisioned sort of taking the form of like white papers or things like that, where you can say, what does an implementation of GitOps look like using XYZ tools? And uh, we envision this, um, this is all still in the works and discussion, but this idea that I want to go and look and see if I want to use uh, AWS or if I want to use uh, Azure or, and I want to use uh, this tool or that tool, the other tool, has somebody made a reference architecture for this, for how they've done GitOps? And, and we can say, you can submit it and you can basically say like, this thing is GitOps compliant, it meets all these standards and um, you know, allow the community to start contributing those and bringing those into the, to the fore so that as more and more people use it, we have a flywheel effect where more and more people are enabled to go and use it practically. Um, there's some other things too. I, don't... I, I think I think you summarized it well. Okay. I, I think there's there's a lot that we have to identify in terms. So we had this big conversation as to how does incident management work with GitOps, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about how how do we do incident management? Management. What happens when things don't work as expected, right? Um, the the tooling that's being built around GitOps is evolving. So we really, matter of fact, is at this point, we really want to reach out. There's, I don't know how many interested parties that kind of expressed interest in, in the working group. We want to reach out to all of them, uh, keep working with the hyperscalers and kind of like increase the adoption of, of uh, GitOps by the cloud providers. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of work, like as I mentioned, right, this is where we are is just the tip of the iceberg and, and we really want to encourage community involvement uh, to produce all this artifacts, right, that, that are going to move move the the paradigm forward. I think we have another question ready. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, one of the differences between maybe continuous delivery and continuous deployment is uh, manual approval steps. And oftentimes you need, you know, a sophisticated amount of progress, or need to be somewhat sophisticated to have that continuous deployment. Canary deployments, um, things like sandbox environments, so you can do UAT. Um, on things before you merge them. Um, is there a place for manual approval steps in GitOps? So I've done a little work around this. Um, there's definitely a place for it, right? And I think, I think an early version of the principle said that um, we, we um, it said something, and I may be butchering it, so sorry. We've done so, so many iterations that the, the, the versioning uh, can be mutated either by a human or a machine, right? Or, or something to that, to that effect, right? And so this, um, something that's writing to Git doesn't necessarily have to be a human, right? It can be part of a CI process, right? Something as simple as um, running a JQ, right, on, or, or, or YQ on, on a YAML file like when you update, you know, an image, right? I'm sure there's tools out there that'll out automatically update image, but I'm just using a simple example. Um, that can be, and then that does a pull request for you, right? So like there's an automated process that, um, that that's the stop gap, right? That someone, the human needs to actually go and, and click merge to actually happen, but what does the pull request doesn't necessarily have to be a human. It can be a process, it could be um, some things like that. So there is, there is ways of, of, of doing things, right, that, that are so conformant to the, um, uh, to the principles themselves. So I don't, I don't know if anyone else had any Yeah, there, on that. There, there are quite a few ways you could cut that mustard. Uh, doing an approval through like a Git PR and that having your approval gates happen in that moment. Um, doing, uh, if you have like a meta state, like a canary release that's occurring, um, well, there, it's open-ended what metrics you could put on there. And you could potentially have a manual intervention saying, Oh no, we caught a problem. We want to. We want to no longer have this move forward. Um, so there, and, and there's maybe a little bit more fuzziness within that. But I, I definitely think that there is. And and actually, to take take it another way, GitOps is a set, as a set of principles to things to implement. Uh, if you feel like you're ninety percent, that's certainly better than being fifty percent. So even if you implemented everything and then you had like a really hard stop approval process that maybe was not in process was well, a stepping stone. Like, we're not going to get you in trouble, you know, if the you have The police is going to come in. Yeah, we're, the GitOps <laughs> police won't come and be like, hey, that thing actually isn't there. Now, I think we should strive for it. I mean, we put these principles together because we strive for them. But um, I think that 
to your point, I think there are lots of ways you could potentially implement approvals in a very GitOps-friendly way. Mm -hmm. There are some less GitOps-friendly ways you could implement approvals as well. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that's probably all the time we have because we're going to need to give the room to the next people. Sure. Um, there were some online questions that didn't get answered, and so will you, do you mind jumping in the chat in the Slack yeah, afterwards? You bet. Okay, I saved the questions, so I'll let you know what they are. Okay. Can we give our panelists a big round of applause? Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.